Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the 1950s, nuclear technology was the new hotness. It was going to solve all sorts of problems around the world. And one of the designers of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller, one of the more outspoken figures, he looked at many, many problems and tried to solve them with nuclear power or even nuclear weapons. I mean, this extended to promoting nuclear explosions to reshape the landscape for civil works projects. And that sounds pretty wild. But he also wanted nuclear reactors to be easily available, ubiquitous, so that anybody could get access to them and do science. And to this end, he actually led a team of young physicists to design an ultra-safe reactor, working based on an idea by Freeman Dyson. And what they ultimately delivered was a nuclear reactor that was so safe that according to uh, Edward Teller, you could actually leave a high school kid in charge and they wouldn't be able to get it to melt down if they did anything wrong. It wasn't simply good enough to have fail-safes in the control systems. The reactor design was such that the laws of physics would stop any nuclear reaction in the core before the core got too hot. Now, if you've ever watched videos showing nuclear reactors generating power pulses accompanied by that eerie blue flash of light, you've probably seen this exact design. And both Tom Scott and Tested have great videos showing experimental reactor at Reed College, which is a liberal arts college that just happens to operate a nuclear reactor for science and education. You know, these are great videos if you want to learn how students might use these reactors. But Explaining how these reactors works means going a little deeper into the nuclear physics than most people go. And I think it's a shame because it's actually one of the coolest thing about these devices. So they're known as TRIGA reactors. That's an acronym for Training, Research, Isotopes, General Atomics. General Atomics is, of course, the company that was building these. And by the way, some people I've heard say TRIGA. I say triga because the I is for isotopes, but I hope none of you get triggered if I use the wrong pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, they're not, look, they're not reactors used to generate electrical power. They're all about research using the radiation that they emit. One example is like neutron activation analysis, where you put a sample close to the core and the neutron radiation which is emitted causes the constituent elements to become slightly radioactive. And then by analyzing the emitted radiation, you can figure out the ratio of elements that were in the sample. And this is the kind of thing that is incredibly useful if you're studying, say, minerals or materials, archaeological artifacts, or even works of art. So it's more than just for physicists who enjoy messing around with nuclear power. So anyways, the reactor is designed safe, such that it won't start up if there's no cooling water around it. And if it starts up, It'll never get hot enough to melt down. Even if you pull the control rod all the way out, what'll happen is it'll ramp up to power and then shut down in a matter of milliseconds. In fact, rapidly pulling out the control rod is a standard operating mode for some of the reactors so that you can generate short, high power pulses that are thousands of times the normal steady state load. It does this by making sure that the fuel stops reacting as it heats up or in reactor design terminology, the fuel temperature coefficient is strongly negative. And this is, a, no, this is normal in reactor design. What it means is that as the reactor materials heat up, something changes and the reaction slows down. A positive coefficient, on the other hand, would mean that as the reaction, uh, the reaction would speed up as things got hotter, which is bad. For example, a positive void coefficient means that as bubbles form in the cooling water, their uh, neutron absorption goes down, the reaction rate increases. That's not a good thing, and it was a factor in the Chernobyl disaster. You really want to have negative temperature coefficients and everything. But, you know, some reactors, the feedback mechanism depends on the temperature of the moderator or the coolant. While in the Trigger reactor design, the feedback is dominated by the temperature of the fuel rods themselves. And that's important because the temperature of the fuel rods rises first and then the other temperatures catch up as the heat is transferred into the other materials. So the Trigger design can be said to have a prompt negative temperature coefficient rather than a delayed coefficient seen in other designs. So reactor operation is based on the concept of neutron balance. The fission reactions generate neutrons, and to keep the reactor running, an average of one neutron from each fission needs to go on to generate another fission. 
Neutrons get lost by escaping the core or by being absorbed by something other than a fissile uranium-235 nucleus, say the huge number of non-fissile uranium-238 nuclei in most reactors. And as it turns out, when you don't have weapons-grade uranium, lower energy neutrons are much more likely to trigger a fission than high energy neutrons that are produced by the fissioning reactions themselves. So to make a reactor work, you have a moderator that takes the high energy uh, neutrons, slows them down or moderates them. And that allows the react reaction to proceed. The moderator will use materials with low atomic mass and low neutron capture cross sections. Common materials are things like hydrogen, usually in water, or graphite. Roughly speaking, as the moderator heats up, it accumulates thermal energy. That thermal energy in the moderator is transferred to the neutrons, which now have higher energy, and that changes the reaction rate inside the reactor. This usually will cause the reaction to slow down, or as the reactor designers say, the reactor has a negative moderator temperature coefficient. It's not the only factor in play for sure. Like, for example, thermal expansion plays a role as it reduces the density of materials and makes the moderators less effective. And your know, reactors have other components that can affect the, the reactivity with temperature and other factors. So anyway, the Trigger reactor works by making the fuel rods out of uranium zirconium hydride, incorporating lots of hydrogen into the fuel material itself. I believe what they do is they make like zirconium hydride and uranium powders and then mix them up and then heat compress them and heat them to make the elements. So the hydrogen in this acts as a moderator to make the reaction proceed, but because it's mixed with the fuel, it responds almost instantly to any temperature increase. So if the reactor is pulsed by pulling the central control rod rapidly, the reaction quickly accelerates and then very quickly stops within milliseconds because the temperature rises. The control rod can then be reinserted at a more leisurely pace. Using the pulse mode, by the way, is really useful if you're studying reactions where multiple neutrons need to be absorbed in quick succession before like unstable intermediate isotopes decay. Now, of course, you can also operate them in continuous mode and the control rod is slowly moved into position to keep the power output at a constant level. So in continuous operation, a typical reactor might be generating hundreds of kilowatts, while the largest pulses generated by Trigger reactors are over 20 gigawatts for you know, milliseconds. Now at this point, I want to step back and point out that my whole explanation of the temperature dependence is grossly oversimplified. The hydrogen atoms that are in that zirconium hydride matrix, they're actually oscillating around inside the crystal structure. And that means because of quantum mechanics, they have discrete energy levels, 0.16 electron volts. And that means that they can't actually cool the neutrons below about 0.16 electron volts, but they're very good at kicking the neutrons back up above this energy. So the reactor actually needs the water to cool the neutrons down to the most efficient reaction level. And if the, if the fuel rods are hot at all, they will very quickly kick the neutrons back up. And that's how you get this very strong, rapid temperature dependence. And this dependence of the reactor on the water is, of course, another safety feature. The design is under-moderated by default, and it relies on the surrounding cooling water to provide neutron moderation to make the reaction proceed. So if there was a catastrophic leak and the core was exposed, no reaction could start, although the core would still be emitting a fair amount of radiation from previous reactions because of the decay of materials. But that wouldn't be dangerous beyond the immediate vicinity of the reactor. There are other possible problems, like if the fuel rods get physically damaged and start to leak fission products into the water, that could be a problem. Again, that can be contained on site. Like the most credible route to an accident that would spread contamination or radiation off site was found to be if when you take their fuel rods out and take them off site for processing. So that's kind of why it's so safe that they can leave it in the hands of students without any risk of a Chernobyl type situation developing. The first reactor of the Triga design was activated in 1958, and it ran for 40 years before being de decommissioned. There are over 60 of these that have been built around the world, and many were built outside the US as part of Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace initiative. 
And I should be clear that there are many other designs of research reactors which have been used and are still being used all over the world. But the majority of the videos that you're going to see on the internet showing a research reactor core generating that eerie blue glow underwater, those are Trigger reactors because they tend to be more accessible than other designs due to their inherent safety. A fairly common alternative design that was found in Canada is the Slowpoke. That's the safe, low power, critical assembly. And I think there's at least a dozen of those. And there are also like pulse reactor designs that mix the uranium fuel with, with graphite instead. Yeah, there's a whole host of research reactors for people that are interested. Now, I also, I know that I also talk about space stuff, or I usually talk about space stuff, but there is actually a link here. The, the SNAP-10A reactor, which was launched into space by the US in the 60s, it used the same uranium-zirconium hydride fuel technology that Triga uses, and it operated successfully for 46 days before an unrelated problem ended the mission. The US is once again looking at flying reactors as power sources for certain missions, and for a long time it was assumed that any space reactor would have to use highly enriched uranium fuel to make it small enough and compact enough to reach critical mass. But that's a problem because highly enriched uranium is a weapons proliferation problem and you want to keep those secure. In 2020, the White House instructed NASA that they were not to use highly enriched uranium in any reactor system for space unless there was no other way to perform the mission. And since then, there have been analyses that brought the reactor masses down to comparable values if they're using this moderated fuel with the zirconium hydride and uranium mixed together. This means that reactors are safer from nuclear proliferation problems, but they also have a shorter operating lifetime because there's less fissile material included. Finally, you might wonder why the extra safety of hydride fuel rods hasn't appeared in conventional power reactors. Those are still using oxide-based fuels. Well, there have been plenty of studies that show that it could be used without any problems, and indeed with the advantages. The main thing is, you have to go through all the research, design, all this huge investment of time and money to upgrade the hardware and the infrastructure to make it work. And that's a bit of a barrier, but isn't that always? I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.